it's been one of the most difficult assignments I've ever had, and I've been thinking about it for some time now, what I might respond to and, and add to the conversation. But partly I, I want to make the observation that here we are, and everything has changed and nothing is different. And that's okay. <laughs> because here we are. And that's part of what's different. I, I brought with me, um, and I want to just uh, add to my self at this moment, um, a shawl that was given to me by um, Sharif al Khatib, whom um, Salma mentioned earlier, who was uh, a friend and colleague and who worked with us in beginning the Muslim project. But it, as I was thinking about this day, I wanted to remember um, not only those on whose shoulders we stand in terms of the earlier centuries of the work to address gender-based violence in this country and around the world, because this is not new work. We did not create this. It's been going on a long time, but also those who uh, have been partners with us and who no longer are with us. And for me, I just wanted to remember specifically Sharifa and Rabbi Julie Spitzer and Kathleen Carlin and Diane Smalley and Mary Violet Burns, all of whom were taken by cancer um, in their prime in terms of their leadership and uh, we have been deprived of that, unfortunately, but we have their memory as part of our work. And I'm sure for you, there are many others as well. So in, in thinking about today, uh, what you all have done is exactly what I was hoping we would do, is reflect together on how this work has brought us together and what we've managed to do. And that's part of the celebration of an anniversary like this is um, we have accomplished amazing, amazing things. We, collectively. And as I say, everything has changed and nothing is different because of the work of thousands and thousands of people who have taken up this work um, in the middle of the 20th century at this point. So my comments in, in reflection will be Brief, I will try. Um, in retrospect, I think I now understand the nature of a call. I think it is that which one feels compelled to do even when it is not clear what that is. At least that's been my experience because in 1977, for me, when I managed to get ordained with without a call is what my church said, you don't have a call, meaning you don't have a job. Well, I didn't have a job because nobody was hiring people to do this work um, at that time. But now I understand what a call is. And there was something that I felt I needed to do, but I didn't even know what it was at the time. And I'm just so grateful that both my church and the people around me pushed and pushed and, and helped me to go ahead and pursue this even though there was no plan. There was no, there was nothing. There was simply a need to do work in this area. Because what I knew then, and, or what I believed then, um, there was the foundation of my thinking and, and movement around the work is the, the experience um, that violence, intimate violence, personal violence, literal violence, is the common thread of women's lives. And if we were to address our social locations and our experiences, various uh, experiences of oppression in ways that were concrete, that we might begin with that common experience as a place where we could come around the table and share and then um, speak from that and, and act on that together. 
So working uh, with women for social change to address racism and sexism as concrete realities and not as abstractions was where I wanted to be. And at the time, the part of the question was, well, where are, where are women? Well, women were in, initially in my experience, were in our churches and in our faith communities in large numbers and usually organized already. So this was the early days of the women's movement in the US and uh, people were trying to figure out how to organize. Well, one of the ways you organize is you find where women are already organized. Yeah. And then you co-op those organizations. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of what we were trying to do. Um, and to confront the fact that our faith communities for too long have been part of the problem and not the solution. So we began to hear stories and understand that survivors were coming forward to help from their faith communities, but then being abused again by ignorance or exploitation. What I now know is that my analysis then was correct even though I've learned a lot in the meantime that has nuanced that and shaped that and as Tracy said, that we, we keep in that conversation to continue to educate and, and teach ourselves so that we do have a fuller understanding. But that basically, I still believe that my original thinking was right. Um, and the work through Faith Trust is to help those, our faith communities to name the unmentionable sins and address them. Institutional change was so important because we, we needed to do that in ways that literally changed institutions so that there would be some ongoing um, difference, uh, whether that be um, in our seminaries, in our denominations, in our organizations, wherever that might be, that that was key to really moving the work forward beyond uh, supporting and assisting it, work with individuals, although that was a certainly a very important part of the foundation that we have. For me, the working through multicultural networks and multi-faith networks was a no-brainer. That's where the work was, and that's where we could find one another uh, who wanted to do this work and were concerned about these issues. And then through that, we found a relationship with one another. Uh, as, as we've shared here, which I think is the way we break down those barriers and begin to really um, work on our common concerns. Even when we don't always share everything or agree about everything, if we can agree that it's not okay for women and children to be abused, then maybe there's a beginning point for our conversation. And I found many of you through this and many others who are not here today for which I am deeply grateful. When Margaret preached my ordination sermon in 1976, I remember that she cautioned me that this path would be lonely. And you could not have been more right. It has been very lonely. And many of you here know the kind of loneliness I am talking about. Many of you have been my touchstones along the way, and I am deeply grateful for those moments of reality check and sanity check and all those things that you've given me. Questions and feedback and confrontation and engagement as we have still held hands and taken the next step forward. How many times when we have raised our voices have we been ignored, passed <coughs> over, yelled at, dismissed, misquoted, etc.? I mean, maybe that hasn't happened to you, but it certainly has happened to you. <laughs> um, and I understand this now with a, a little more perspective. Hardly anyone wants to buy what we're selling, and I keep trying to explain this to um, uh, Faith Trust <laughs> as we we're trying to, to make our way forward as an organization. It's, it's, uh, it's not a real good um, fact of life for uh, any entrepreneurial effort if what you are selling is not something people want to buy. But in fact, we are suggesting there are these other inconvenient truths and 
There's so many reasons that survivors, perpetrators, and bystanders do not want to go there. And I count myself among, among them. I never wanted to go here <laughs> um, in terms of um, the, the, the painful stories, the painful realities that um, we live with and that we, we share with each other. It's not, it's not a place I ever wanted to be. But what I have found is that, as one of my colleagues once said to me, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you flinch <laughs> before it sets you free. That when people are offered the chance to know the truth and speak their truth in a supportive environment, amazing transformation does occur. These are moments of justice and mercy and grace. And this is, after all, in my mind, the point of our faith journeys. So as we, um, uh, Emily had asked me to, to just comment briefly on sort of, you know, what I had learned. And I'm going to just quickly not go into these, but just give you a few highlights that came to mind. Um, certainly, if we didn't know it before, we know it now that the work to end gender-based violence will take a very long time. We're talking about generational work. Um, as long as patriarchy is in place, gender-based violence thrives and protects the patriarchy. So we will pass this along to the next generation and hopefully, maybe not the next generation, but uh, perhaps. Another thing that I've learned is that justice is better than sex. <laughs> and sex is pretty fun and um, I always thought it was the most fun you could have without spending money. <laughs> but um, justice is better than that. Because justice, there's a depth to it and a, an intensity to finally experiencing or seeing a moment of justice um, that heals uh, long-standing wounds deeply. And that is very, very satisfying. Institutions generally change only when they're forced to. I guess we should have known that, but we seem to have to learn it over and over. And education and training are necessary, but not sufficient. Only genuine transformation of the heart and soul will bring change to in individuals and institutions. And finally, maintaining a feminist NGO is a huge challenge. Nothing in seminary prepared me for this. There should be a course for, I think, all women in, in seminary training on how to raise money, how to manage money, how to supervise people, how to work in an in a organizational setting. Um, because some of us have learned this the hard way and kind of made it up as we went along. Right, Mary? <laughs> but only through the hard work of board members and staff and volunteers has Faith Trust survived until today. And, and I want to particularly um, give my gratitude to the staff and, and board who are here today at this stage of our lives, um, and particularly to uh, Jane, who has been our executive director for the last 10 years. And without your persistent leadership, uh, Faith Trust would not be here today. So I am deeply grateful for that. And finally, one of, I think, my lessons has been to have realistic expectations. Um, I've often used the, the metaphor of baseball. I use it a lot of, a lot of time <laughs> to help people understand Things. And um, in baseball, batting 300 means that out of your 10 times at bat, you get three hits. And then you get in the Hall of Fame with a 300 average. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I think it's important, as, especially. Um, those of you who are coming into this work at this point, to have realistic expectations because um, 
Now, hopefully, on a good day, you're batting 300. But it's okay that you aren't batting 500 or 900 because it doesn't, it's not going to happen. But the 300 is, is pretty sweet. So finally, I just, I just want to comment on what's happening because um, this, the, the fact that we're coming together at this time in 2017 and, and uh, all the stuff that's happening in our um, communities around sexual abuse is happening is uh, quite amazing, I think, on the one hand. But uh, I, I do want to comment on the current news cycle, beginning with Harvey Weinstein. Because I'm always trying to think about, okay, what does this mean? What, what is, how does this relate? How do, what's the, you know, that's kind of what I do in my spare time, is kind of try to hold all the pieces together. But the value added thing to this story about Weinstein is that it's exposed not only this individual's abusive behavior, but also the underbelly of an institution that has allowed and supported exploitation of young actors by powerful men for so many years. The fact that he suffered immediate significant consequences is, I think, what has empowered so many women and men to come forward and say, me too. Because finally there was something, there was a response to the disclosures in spite of his denials. There was a response by his setting, his institution, that said, enough. Is this a tipping point? People are talking about this being a tipping point. Well, maybe, but it's only a tipping point if we run with it. It's not, it's not automatically a tipping point. But if we take this time and these experiences and run with them and um, utilize them, then it may be a tipping point. But I, I'm sort of thinking it's more likely a crossroads. And it's a crossroads, significant crossroads, where we have a choice to make, we as a society. Will we choose a different path? And will we recognize the enormity of sexual abuse and exploitation in every institution and in every community and then act to address them? I do want to acknowledge that the work of thousands that has come before has created fertile ground for this moment. And what pleases me greatly is to see many thoughtful voices responding and taking leadership um, in our faith communities. You know, people were preaching last week about what is happening. And they were doing it well-informed, thoughtful, critical, um, and that's part of, you know, what to, together we have helped create that opportunity. But now it is great to see people uh, picking up the responsibility and, and going with it. The fact that we now have evangelicals who are speaking out against Roy Moore, who are being self-critical and saying this is ridiculous and this is not what who we are as Christian people. Um, or the laity in the Roman Catholic Church who have uh, long been engaged in uh, the fight against priest pedophilia. Um, this, is, this is how the work moves forward. But I want to challenge our faith communities and our institutions even further. I would be remiss if I did not take advantage of being at the AER to do something like this. Um, why isn't there a whole track here at the AER addressing sexual exploitation and abuse? Those of you who are publishing and teaching in these issues, about these issues, know that this doesn't help you're getting a job or tenure. Uh, but you do it anyway, and good on you. But if you get a reputation for truth telling, you might not get a job. Yet we need the scholarship of the academy to ground our activism. We need it desperately. Because we need to be able to show and to say that a human experience of suffering shared by all women and many men cannot go unaddressed by people of faith. We are part of the problem, but we have to be part of the solution. Survivors' voices have taught us saying, this was done to me and it matters. 
The It Matters part is the work of justice making and the response of the wider community for those of us who are then bystanders. How will we respond? How will we manage to organize ourselves to respond to those victims and survivors and say, we stand together and you are not alone? That's our task. Uh, let me just close with a quote from St. Augustine, one of my favorite saints. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I guess it takes a Catholic to really appreciate that. <laughs> Irony there. But um, he, is, he, is, uh, he has been quoted as saying, um, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are Anger and Courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. I would now like to express these sentiments a little bit differently and say, hope has two mothers. They are anger and courage. Together, anger and courage brings us the possibility of change. And this is the basis of our hope. And it is my privilege and, and uh, with great gratitude to be a part of this effort. And um, thank you all for coming here tonight and sharing this time with me and with all of us. Uh, I'm done. <laughs>